I just want to start kind of the mini-sermon, because I'm going to be sharing some stories in between, too, but I want to first remind us of why we're still here. I mean, you know, we love to sing. We love to fellowship. We love to be the church and to serve one another. But there's only one thing that we can do better here, or we'll do here that we'll never do in heaven. All those things I just mentioned, we'll do better in heaven than here, except reach the lost. And we need to stop seeing the people around us as just people or opposing points of view or those people and start seeing them as lost souls. Lost souls that Jesus died for as much as he died for yours and mine. You know? One of the worst affirmations ever, even though I understand where they're coming from when they say it, is evangelize all the time. Use words when necessary. So when aren't words necessary? I mean, if we're going to lead people to Christ, I know we can shine, show Jesus love, be generous, but without words, it can't be enough. Because the Bible says salvation comes by hearing, and hearing the word, the word of God. So we've got to go beyond that if we're going to really make a difference in the kingdom of heaven. And you guys are all really familiar with the Great Commission verses. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. But we forget, first of all, the verse before it. Because Jesus, before he gives that famous command, says, all authority is mine. All authority has been given to me, authority on heaven and on earth. So that's why I can tell you to make disciples. Because in the verse, go and make disciples, the command is make. Because we're always going. Jesus knew that. He knew in 2021 we'd really be going. So the command isn't go. The command is make. Because if you're here today... You either know Jesus Christ and are one of the ones who ought to be making disciples, or you have yet to become a disciple. There's no in-between. We're all going. It depends on what we're doing when we go. And that the authority is the big factor, especially for us guys. I mean, we hate submission. We love control. But we are under authority, and we have to remember that. We have to remember that all of our... Every day there has to be a, a decision to submit to his authority of what we're going to do, of how we're going to use... how he's going to have us use our time. We've got to be sensitive. And that doesn't come without time in the Word. I mean, we have to be ready to follow him even if that means being thought of as a criminal and dying as a nobody, which is what happened to him. Denying ourselves, taking up our cross, being ready to die, and following him. Our church has adopted 1 John 2.6 as their theme verse which says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And we've talked a lot about it, walking like Jesus walked and what that looks like and what that means. And the right words shared by the right people can make all the difference. And folks, we are the right people. If we will share the right words, we are the right people. We can change, change someone's future destination forever with his word, with the right words. We've got we've to use those words. God has chosen to speak through you and I. In fact, the context of 1 John 2, verse 6 that I just read says, verses 3 to 6 say, here's how we know 
that we know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments or do what he says is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word or obeys his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. And this is how we know that we are in him, because whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So that's the context. So we can't call ourselves true followers of Jesus Christ if we don't carry out his biblical mandates. We can't say, I love God, and not love his word. Those two are inseparable, and we must not forget that. So all that to say that Jan and I continue to try to make a difference for Jesus Christ, as you would expect us to, and as God would expect us to, and as he expects you to as well. And that's why our theme verse is Psalm 109, 27, that they may know that this is your hand, that you, Lord, have done it. It's not about us being special people, because we're not. It's not about a lot of formal education. We don't have it. It's about surrender. It's about every day waking up and saying, not my will, but yours. Because I have to fight that. There are a lot of days or a lot of situations where I'd rather wake, wake up or, or go to a situation or I see a situation and I say, no, not your will, but mine, please. Right? So it, it is a daily battle, and it is for us as well. And I just want you guys to know that as we talk about this. COVID hit Brazil really hard. At the beginning, like the rest of the world, there was a lot of confusion but it has carried through, and it's still really, really bad down there. Just in April, a couple of months ago, in Brazil, there were two to three people a minute dying, at least supposedly, of COVID. It's gotten a little bit better, but we've, we were in complete lockdown from March through August last year, complete. Almost everything was closed, except what they called essential services. Everything else was closed. You hardly ever left your house. We, were, we had a couple of curfews. Masks are a mandate still today. A person is fined if they don't have a mask on out in public. Business, they're fined like the equivalent of, like, it'd be like 500 bucks. And a business is fined 10 grand if someone is in their store or place of business without a mask on. So there's a lot of incentive for that. Vaccines have been stolen. Vaccines have been faked and falsified. Um, one of the secretaries of health refused 20 million vaccines last year. I don't know, because maybe they didn't give him a kickback he wanted. We don't know. Nurses have been filmed, sticking the needle in people, not pushing down the plunger, and then pulling it out and putting it in their pocket. So people think they got the vaccine, and they didn't. I mean, it's just nuts. Nuts. And I'm not saying the vaccine is magic and the cure-all, because we all know it's not. Um, but anyway, just kind of gives you a background. So when our church did reopen, it was masks all the time, even when singing, all the windows open. So now it's winter down there, and when it's 40 degrees outside, it's 40 degrees inside, because there's no heat anywhere. So people have their masks on, all the windows open, social distancing, and worshiping the Lord without taking their masks off. No fellowship, no Sunday school, I'm not a super fan of all this digital media and chat groups and all social media and all that, but I had to learn to passionately preach to my phone every Sunday, just me and my phone, and every Wednesday, and we would record videos so the church people could watch them. Jan would record about five songs every Sunday and send them to the church people. They would do their own service. Then after we got back, we were able to start doing lives as well. A church gave us an offering. We could buy a computer and a camera, and that helped some. But we were finally having a service 
We had it for two weeks last September, and then we had to shut down for a couple weeks because somebody tested positive. But God has miraculously protected our people where we've hardly had anyone get it or get it seriously. And some of our people are working more than before because of the types of jobs they had. And, and in, the, in the areas where, area where we live and our churches, people ignore so much because the cops ignore it. The cops don't want to deal with these outlying neighborhoods and the poorer people in neighborhoods. They don't care. So people pretty much do what they want, um, regardless of all, all the laws. But our church has chosen to try to be a good example, because a lot of churches have been bad examples as well. Um, but during all this crazy pandemic, a lot of you know, unexpected things obviously happened. Uh, some of our businessmen had to close shop and all that. Well, we get a monthly statement, and on that statement, we get reporting of all the giving from the month before through Baptist Mid-Missions. Last March, when we got our statement mid-April, there was a gift for $1,000 from somebody we'd never heard of. Never heard of them. Still don't know who it was. I looked at Jan and we said, COVID relief? Yes, we gave it all away. Two weeks later, there was another gift of $1,000 from someone we'd never heard of. Not the same person, someone else. Again, and this, isn't the, this stuff doesn't happen. Not very often, anyway. We gave it all away. Before the end of April, we got a gift for $5,000. Gave it all away. And this just kept happening and happening and happening. We never asked for a penny for COVID relief. But God started sending, and he has kept sending. And God has allowed us to be a huge blessing in so many ways. Skip to the first picture slide, would you? Here are just a, a few examples. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Oh, wait, go back one. Before, this is very important. A month ago today, we married off our baby girl, Caitlin. Named after Caitlin Jackson, who many of you have known her whole life. Um, got married a month ago down in Chattanooga. Um, was awesome and heart-wrenching, and we're so thankful that we could shed tears because that means we had a good relationship, you know. And uh, Daddy, I mean, I, you know, I didn't have to walk my sons down the aisle. I did their weddings, um, but walking Caitlin down the aisle was brutally sweet, let's put it that way. And then she split the ceremony between me and her three brothers, so whew, I didn't have to do the whole thing. And that saved me a little bit of uncontrolled emotion. But they're doing really well, and we're just so grateful for for what the Lord has done in their lives and what he's going to do. He's a godly young man. She's a godly young woman. So we're very thankful for that. Okay, back we go. So somebody's fridge burned out. God allowed us to replace it. S online school has been going on for over a year. Well, kids didn't even have notebook computers. You know, they're trying to do online school with their daddy's phone or whatever. You're in first grade. So we got a little computer. We've been paying school bills. We paid rent for a couple businesses. We paid utility bills. We paid funeral costs. We paid health insurance costs. We've bought food and given it away. We made 20 baskets and gave them away to unsafe families. I mean, you name it, we've been doing it. Um, God has just allowed us to do so many things. So then we got a gift just now in April, a couple thousand dollars, uh, and we decided to put gift baskets together specifically for unsafe people. So this next slide shows, shows those being put together. We put together 50 baskets. That, this picture here is half of the food. Then I had bags made and we filled them. And the next slide shows all of, all of the food. Each family got about 65 pounds worth of staple food. And they got two DVDs, and uh, one, by the way, one DVD was donated. The other one I found for like 50 cents a piece. Good evan evangelistic DVDs. Uh, a book, a copy of an a abbreviated version of Purpose Driven Life, and a tract and information on our online services and everything. And I said to our church people, no one at church gets one of these. You've been taking care of each other, which they have. You're going to keep taking care of each other. These are specifically 
to give to unsafe families that you know that need help. And I said, but a couple of things. One, we're not going to give any of them away from our church building. This isn't about our church being known. It's about Christ being known. Number two, these are just a key. These food baskets are keys to unlock the doors to evangelism, to serious evangelism. I said, you will not give away one of these and say, oh, yeah, God bless our church here. This is for you, and walk away. You will be intentional in sharing clearly the gospel. If you still can't, take someone with you who can. And that's what our people have been doing. And we left right before they started. Oh, it's just been so hard to not be part of that. Even though every year we pray that God will save souls while we're gone, I want to be there, right? Um, and there's been some amazing stories of what God has done through these, these uh, gifts being given out. So that was another thing that God allowed us to do that was just really, really exciting. Then there was another thing as well, because as lockdown kind of eased up a little bit, um, moms started taking their kids out. And I mean, most of them, they live in their homes are smaller than most like motorhomes here. And their backyard is literally probably about as big as this much of the platform. No grass, just tile. So can you imagine? You got three or four kids. You say, go outside and play. That's all they had, you know? And um, so moms get their kids dressed to go out. And the clothes don't fit. They haven't had to wear anything but a, you know, pair of shorts or pajamas almost for a year or for eight months. So um, moms were handing down clothes to other moms from our church, and Jan started buying clothes for kids too. And uh, God let her do that for, I don't know, three or four different, different families. And it was really, really neat to see that happen. One family, in fact, Jan ordered all the clothes, and God worked it out because we didn't even know it. But we had them delivered straight to their house, and she got them on her fifth birthday. In fact, the mom was trying to refuse the delivery because she said, it's not me. I don't know. It's not me. She's a new believer. She, she uh, didn't even really know Jan's full name. And her nephew, was, who was from our church, was there and said, I think that's Pastor Dave's wife. And so she finally, the guy said, look, you have to take this. And she took it, and it was like eight outfits for her little girl. So that was really cool, because two days before on Zoom prayer meeting, she had been crying, this new believer had been crying, saying, I don't have any money to give our daughter a, a party on her fifth birthday, and she's not going to understand. And I know it's a silly thing, but just pray that God will make it special. And she had said the birthday, and Jan pokes me and says, said, did she say April 11th? And I go, yeah, that's the day the clothes are arriving. So it was really cool how God did that. So she's been able to do that for several different people. These specifically, the malls had just opened a couple weeks before we got, we came back. I think this was our last week in Brazil. We go to the mall, Jan says, I'm going to go get some baby clothes. Can I get them for one of the ladies? I said, sure, I'm going to a coffee shop. So 45 minutes later, I get back to the store. Here's Jan. You know, and I go, what in the world? She says, I know, help me go through them. So we go through them, end up with maybe 10 outfits. And um, she goes, is that still too much? You know, and I go, no, it's all right. So we buy all these outfits, and later you're going to see who these specifically went to. But it's just another way God allowed us, through the gifts people gave, to be able to help other people. <clears throat> so anyway, just really, really neat. <clears throat> Excuse me. So next slide. This is uh, Marcelo. I want you guys to remember to pray for Marcelo. We've known him most of his life. A great young man. Actually did a year of seminary. Great musician. Good athlete. Taught my boys how to play soccer. Was in our youth group. Was actually a leader in our youth group at our last church plant. And loved music and wanted fame and fortune. Turned his back on the Lord and church. Walked away from it all to join a reggae band and live the reggae lifestyle. He fathered two children, lived with a different gal, did every drug you can imagine, was addicted to drugs and alcohol, tried to come back to the Lord a couple years ago, didn't, succumbed and went back into the lifestyle. I was 
getting on him because he had told me he was coming back, and I was getting on him, telling him, don't give up, to the point where he blocked me for a couple of years. Then he called me up in March and said, I'm, I came back to the Lord. Wanted to see me right away. I went over and saw him, took the picture, and he's so excited. And he's just so excited about being restored and being able to be used again. And I'm sending him verses every day, and we're talking. And he joined our church, and he wrote to me two weeks ago and said, Pastor Dave, I took communion for the first time in 15 years. Because that's how long he was away from the Lord. On Mother's Day, next slide, he brought his whole family to our church. His two children were in church for the very first time. His mom and dad are solid believers. And it was Mother's Day, and I was challenging the mothers on sacrifice. And I said, I asked Marcelo's mom, I said, did you ever stop praying for your son? She said, absolutely not. So I don't know if you have a wayward son or daughter, but don't stop praying for him. Don't give up. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's heartbreaking. But God is hearing. And God is teaching. And God is working. And Marcelo is back and so excited about how he can serve the Lord more. He owns a little paper product store that's become his mission field. He's given away books to several people. People come in to ask him for a counsel, want him to pray with them and everything. He's invited people to our church. In fact, one gal came a couple weeks before we... We came back on furlough, and he whispered to me, he says, believe it or not, she's a girl I got drunk with for the, the last time I got drunk right before I came back to the Lord. She was at church with him, and she's a believer who walked away from the Lord. So you just never know how God's going to work and what he's going to do. And so just remember to pray for Marcelo. This next one is Loida, which means blondie. She's the one whose daughter got the clothes when she turned five, right on her birthday. She's the one that was crying. She and her husband are school bus drivers. You know how much work they've had the last year plus? Zero. And Mayumi, their little girl, has some eye issues, so we help them pay uh, health insurance. We've helped them pay some bills. Um, next slide. Her husband is still unsaved. He's heard the gospel clearly, uh, I don't know, a hundred times, and he knows full well that he is unsaved. He knows it's a matter of surrender and giving up control. And he says, I'm not ready yet. He says, I know God has done amazing things. I know God has used you guys to bless my family and help us survive. I know. I know. I, but I can't yet surrender. So pray for Minori. He's half Japanese. They spent eight years in Japan. He's got a lot of that baggage. Lloyd, of course, is praying for him, his wife. She's just doing great as this young believer. I forgot to explain a little bit that the picture that I showed you of her, she actually snuck that picture. She was at a doctor's office just a couple weeks after she'd gotten saved, sitting next to a lady who was also there, and uh, was able to share the little bit she knew about the Lord with that lady. So she took that picture just for me to see the gal behind her and said, pray for, pray for her, because I'm trying to tell her about Jesus. So it's just really neat how God uses all these little, little things. So the next slide, Vanessa, this is a friend of Loida's who just gave her life to Christ a month ago. Well, a little over a month ago now. But this is just a snapshot I took of her at our Zoom prayer meeting. Before she was even saved, she came to Zoom prayer meeting with Loida, just to see how it was. And she shared requests, and I peeked a couple times. She would just watch us with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, praying for her request. And it just blew her away, and Loida's love for the Lord in such a short time and witnessing to her just drew her to the Lord. She gave her life to Christ. Next slide is a picture she sent me of her husband, her husband's name is Adayusom. We call him Dai. I've never met him, but I'm praying for him. He is unsaved. She sent me this picture because he was passed out drunk on the couch. She said, just pray that God would keep him from drinking. He's such a good man when he doesn't drink. And we started praying for him in May. He still has not drunk again till this day. His friends are trying to get him to drink. He's gone to a couple events and 
not drunk. He said, I'm going to drink on my birthday, which was June 26th. Didn't happen. He was going to go to a big party somewhere, a Brazilian cookout, and, and drink there. And there was a big storm. They couldn't even go. But he's starting to get on her for going to church because he doesn't want her to go to church. So we continue to pray, and she continues to invite him, but she's trying to just show him through the changes in her life that she's a believer because others in our church are witnessing to him. Um, so anyway, remember to pray for both Vanessa and Dai, and that Dai will give his life to Christ. Next slide is Dalidia. Dalidia is a pastor's daughter, now part of our church, but she walked away from the Lord, married an unsaved guy, had a, had a daughter, and uh, then came back to the Lord. He got saved. A couple years ago, we had a little wedding ceremony for him in our church. And being a pastor's kid, she grew up serving the Lord, knows how to serve the Lord. She's a school teacher and a school coordinator. Well, they got, um, they got married. He got baptized so that they could be members and serve the Lord. And they live quite a ways away from our church. She just got convicted there was no Bible influence in their neighborhood. So a couple months ago, she started a little Bible study in her home. This picture was taken the second week. Every kid in the picture gave their life to Jesus the second week. There are more now going than were in this picture. And her little girl is one right in front here with a big smile. But it's just God using people in the middle of corona to keep spreading his word. And we're just so thankful for Dalidia and what she's done. The next slide is Daiz and Shikong. Shikong is a member of our church. He's that, that's a nickname for Big Francisco. That's him, Chicon. His wife, Thais, is unsaved. Their little baby girl, did I write the name right? Oh, I didn't write the baby's name. Her, their girl's name is Manuela, Manu. So on Mother's Day, we dedicated their baby. Chicon came to me and said, I know my wife isn't saved yet, but is it okay if we dedicate our baby at church? I said, of course, you're a member. He's a, just a great lover of Jesus and great evangelist. And so Thais came to church, and we know it's not about the baby. So they're standing in front of our church, and she's saying in front of our church, yes, I commit to raising our daughter in the, you know, in the Lord's word. I commit to bringing our daughter to church. I mean, that was the first time she was ever in our church. But what's cool is that our ladies had already broken the ice because when they did baby showers for a couple different pregnant gals in our church, they did one for her just blew her mind that these ladies she doesn't even know would care enough to have a, a baby shower for her. And so she came to our church, Mother's Day. Well, the next week, Jan bought all those clothes. And I said, tell Thais to come to church because you've got a surprise for her. So Thais came to church to get a surprise. Heard the word of God again. And uh, she's written to Jan and I since we've been back, sent us pictures of Manu. Um, I don't know if she's been back to church, but I know that God is working. And through Corona Relief, we were able to bless her in a special way too. And obviously as things open up, we can go visit her in her home and everything as well. Um, but pray for the Lord to save Thais. Next slide, a couple other gals. Noemi and Tawani. Sensed in between them is Callie, a gal from our church. Callie's a cosmetologist, and she teaches um, hair cutting and coloring and styling and eyebrow shaping and makeup and all that stuff. Callie has five daughters from four different men, I think, or three. Her last daughter is the one that she had right before she got saved. She and her husband are members of our church now, but with her past, she was perfect to witness these two gals. Who are no Noemi and Tawani? Well, in Brazil, everything in Sao Paulo, at least, is handled by motorcycle delivery guys. Medicine, documentation, food, all of it. So we order a rotisserie chicken every Sunday and a motorcycle delivery boy comes. Well, this guy came, his name was Caillou, I met him, and Tawani was on the back of his bike. And chatting back and forth, they just moved in together, and I, as a pastor, said, hey, 
you, know, you guys ought to get married. God would love it if you guys got married. I gave them a book. We talked, kind of started a little, you know, broke the ice a little bit. They came a couple more times. We'd always just have some small talk. And then they didn't come for a while. Then this other couple came. Same situation. They'd moved in together. They weren't married. Gave them a book. Actually gave them a little money to help them pay for their um, wedding at the Justice of the Peace. I don't think they've done that yet. Um, but then, so they're delivering, you know, chickens too. And there were other delivery people. So I didn't see either one of these couples for a few weeks. And then finally, Caillou and Tawani come again with a chicken. I say, oh, man, I haven't seen you guys in so long. He goes, yeah, I know. He says, every Sunday I get to the, to the chicken place and I try to get your delivery. And somebody else has already got it. And I walk in with the chicken and I'm thinking to myself, Wow. And I say to Jen, isn't it something that because we just show we care, people want to be the ones to deliver us our chicken because it's not just, oh, thanks, and walk back in the door. You know? Why? Just because we care. So on Mother's Day, they show up. And I asked Tawani, so what you're going to do for Mother's Day? She said, oh, I don't even know who my mom was. And I say, oh, I'm so sorry. She said, oh, it's all right. My grandma raised me, but she died in August of COVID. And I say, I'm sorry again. And she says, I think I remember you. And I go, you got to be kidding me. From where? She says, well, I used to live down at the end of your street when I was just a little girl, like three, four, five years old. And the, the, there's this group of families down at the end of our road, and we would bring them into the empty lot of our retreat center and tell them Bible stories and feed them. When groups were down, we would have games for the kids and interact with them. We helped them a lot. And she was one of those little girls. And she remembered that. Just crazy. So that was the last time I saw them before we came to the States. But the next week, eh, I might be a week off. Anyway, the other couple came back one more time, and I'm chit-chatting with them. And he says, yeah. Everything is good except the bank's trying to repo my motorcycle. And I said, well, why? He says, well, I can't make enough money to make the payments on it. So I came in and I said to Jan, what do you think, COVID relief? She goes, sure. So I wrote to the owner. I didn't write to him. I didn't even have his contact info. I said, find out how much he owes on his bike because we'd like, we'd like to see if we could help. And she writes back, wait, what? And there's, in Brazil, they have this, saying, people like you don't exist. It's like, why would you help him? So anyway, she found out, boiled down to, it's about 200 US dollars he owed on his motorcycle. I didn't know him from Adam. I didn't want to do too much, so I said, find out how much he has. Well, he had about half of it. I said, all right, tell him to come to my house with his half and the bill, and I'll pay it off. He'll give me his half of the money, I'll pay it off right in front of him with my phone app. So he and he and Noemi came, came into our garage, paid the bill, gave them a track, witnessed 100% clearly to them. They heard the whole gospel. And, um, I mean, he's just there shaking his head like, I don't understand. I can't believe this. I don't know why you would help me pay off my motorcycle. So I got to just say, hey, you know, it's because of people that love the Lord and are generous. That's why I said it's not even our money. And um, so then I asked Noemi, I said, what do you do? Which I kind of already knew the answer because poor Brazilians usually graduate from high school. A lot of them can hardly read. She said, hey, I, don't, I don't have a job. I don't, I don't have any courses. She's like 20 years old. I said, well, what do you like to do? She says, well, I've always wanted to learn how to shape eyebrows. I go, well, there's this gal in my church that does that. I'm going to... I'm going to get the course for you to do. I'm going to give it to you as a gift. So this was the day before our prayer meeting. So on Zoom prayer meeting, I share this, and Kelly writes to me in private during prayer meeting on my phone, says, I'm going to give it to her as a gift. <clears throat> Jan and I wanted to give it to her as a gift. But seriously, we were really happy she wanted to do that. So it ended up both girls did that course, and they did a makeup course, and the whole time they're there for like two or three hours, four or five times, Kelly's witnessing to him. Kelly's telling her story. Kelly's getting on. I mean, they've both done drugs some, you know, just the typical unsaved young gal's past. And Kelly's sharing the gospel with them. 
like I said, we left before they gave out all those big uh, staple food baskets. But each one of them and their families got one and heard the gospel. And through them, a couple other people heard the gospel. And it's just been amazing what God has done. They said they want to come to our church. They haven't come yet. But the one couple, Caillou and Tawani, they actually video called us to thank us for their gift basket. We were already here in the States. Um, all this because of ordering chicken and having motorcycle delivery people come that we just engaged a little bit. I mean, all of us can do that. All of us can do that. Wherever we are, with whoever it is. So don't ever think, oh, that's just... Yeah, he's a missionary. Of course he'll do that. No. You just got to care a little bit and take a step. Next slide is about a good friend of ours, Ronaldo. Ronaldo had a son, met a gal, got married, had a daughter, got saved, was a great servant in our church, semi-professional table tennis player, built his own mountain bike, ended up five years ago getting a disease called Guillain-Barre, kind of rare disease, where your muscles and brain stop talking to each other. It can hit a three-year-old or a 103-year-old, but usually people are over it within six months to a year. Well, his got so bad that his diaphragm stopped working, so he couldn't breathe on his own. So they put him in a, on a breathing apparatus, and he had to do a trach. For a while, he could still talk, and then he couldn't talk anymore. Then his mouth stopped moving. Then his eyes stopped moving. He was flat on his back for five years with a feeding tube and nothing from 38 to 43. We had a service at his house at his, in his little bedroom every week during all this time. Jan and I would go besides that and visit at different times. So many nurses and physical therapists heard the gospel. Some doctors heard the gospel. Many nurses got saved. One of them already is moved to Miami, is in a, in a Baptist church she found in Miami because she heard the gospel and got saved in Ronaldo's bedroom. Ronaldo was shining without being able to even express himself. They would see tears run out his eyes while we sang his favorite songs. They would see tears run out his eyes while we shared scripture with him and prayed with him. But they heard the truth through us as well. The next slide shows Ronaldo with his wife and daughter watching one of the online sermons. And I got to be honest with you. Two years ago when we were here in the States for our eight weeks, I prayed and said, Lord, I've been, I, I, I've been so excited. We've all been praying. We've all been praying already, Lord, for three years for you to do a miracle in Ronaldo's body. And I'm just so excited to hear the stories he's going to tell him. He, he and your back and forth and some of the arguments and some of the encouragement, every, there had to be so many supernatural moments because he's fully conscious. He can feel pain. He can't show anything, nothing. Nobody could understand anything. And I said, Lord, if you're not going to answer our prayer in the way we'd like you to, please take him while I'm here because I don't want to do his funeral. And at the beginning of this year, he was having fever and throwing up and everything, and they finally, finally figured out that it was all, they put him on antibiotics, all kinds of different things. It took him over a month to figure out he's got kidney stones kidney stone, besides everything else. I mean, he feels all this pain. So they take him to the hospital. His wife, Sida, quit her job five years ago to care for him full time. Did a better job than most of the nurses. But she couldn't be with him at the hospital because of COVID and all that. So they did the surgery. He was doing great. Put him in ICU. And she called the doctor, and he said, oh, yeah, he's doing better. You might be able to, he might be out of ICU. You might actually be able to see him in a couple days. He said, well, would you let me video chat him? He said, no, we only let people video chat right before they're going to be intubated for corona because 
they're probably going to die. And so it's the last thing they do before they get intubated. So he wouldn't let her video chat him, and he passed away. He passed away. I got a call at 5.30 in the morning from Sida, crying and saying that the Lord took Ronaldo. And everything stops in Brazil because they have to be buried within 24 hours. There's no embalming. The public cemeteries are so over full that they're exhuming bodies in three years to make room for more. It's just the reality down there. So everybody drops everything. We got to at least have a funeral because he did not die of COVID. Because if he died of COVID, there's no open casket. The burial guys are in full hazmat. The family has to stand far away. They, the, the casket just goes there straight to the, to the burial site, and in it goes, just like that. And can you imagine with three a minute dying around the country, how that is in the third largest city in the world? So we were blessed to be able to have a funeral service for Ronaldo there at the cemetery. And our church people, through tears, are singing his favorite praise songs. His whole family is there. I'd spent three hours or more preparing what I was going to say from the time I got the phone call to the time we left. We got there. We cried with Sida. We prayed with Sida. We paid her, her funeral bill for her. And then it was finally time to share. Before that, I went in and I looked at, at the shell that had been Ronaldo's body. That is Sida and Ingrid her now 13, 12 or 13 year old daughter, who since she was seven years old, daddy's been flat on his back. And I had to take a picture of his hands because there's this little round band-aid on his hand. And I looked at that round band-aid and I thought to myself, it's like some kind of a sick joke. For any of us who knew Ronaldo, we knew how much he'd been poked and cut and all the suffering and all the pain, ongoing and ongoing to the point where he couldn't even move his eyeballs. Five years flat on his back. And there's a little bandaid on his hand. It's like, are you kidding me? And right then and there, God reminded me of, first, of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 where Paul says, for our momentary suffering is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory that's waiting for us in Christ Jesus. And I threw away almost everything I was going to say and instead just shared that thought. And I said to Ronaldo's family, I said, you know, if Ronaldo were here right now, he would point at, him, at himself in the cast and he'd say, that band-aid, it's true. That's everything I went through is nothing. That bandage represents it all compared to what I'm already experiencing over the last eight hours in heaven. It was such a hard time, and I've done some hard funerals. This one, I think, was the worst. But I know God used the funeral as well. I'd really love for you guys to remember to keep praying for Seed and Ingrid, even though it's been four months already, it's still really, really hard. Really hard. It's hard for all of us. But Ronaldo touched dozens of lives. Probably none of us would have ever seen Ronaldo and our church indirectly. None of us would have ever seen or met those people except for him being on his back all this time. And we won't know until we get to heaven the full why and the full what God did through all that. And it didn't make it any easier, but not everything is just awesome, amazing stories either. It's a reality, and it's tough sometimes. And this year, coming to the States for four months instead of two like usual, I didn't want to leave my deacons with all the burden of caring for things while we're gone, so I'd been praying that God would send someone along to help us. And we already knew this young couple, in it, and uh, Pastor Alex and Angela, um, they had just left their last ministry, and he was like already almost burnt out. He was 30 years old. The church had treated him pretty poorly. Um, he actually didn't want to be a senior pastor anymore. 
They sold their car and their keyboard and his computer to be able to survive for a while. Somebody gave them a house to rent really cheaply. They're at a church not too far from our church, uh, trying to get their hearts to heal. And he said, I might be an associate pastor, but man, that, I've been beat up and dragged around and I just can't take it. And all this time, I've been praying for somebody that God would send along. And I just wanted to meet with him to encourage him. So we go out, we're having coffee, and we're chit-chatting back and forth. And, and he says, you know the funny thing, Pastor? And this was in, at the beginning of May. He said, it's only been three months, but I already miss preaching. And God kind of like goes. And I go, well. So I told him what I was thinking. Long story short, he and his wife accepted um, to come and just cover for us while we're gone. I keep reminding him, you're not a candidate. I keep reminding our church, he's not a candidate. He reminds people in our church, I'm not a candidate, although we're praying he will be a candidate. But we want to make sure their hearts heal. He loves our church. Our church loves him. He's being a huge blessing, and our church is blessing him back. She finally just got a job. She's a teacher. But just pray for Alex and Angela also. Um, it's just been a big blessing to have them there and know that my deacons aren't carrying uh, all the weight of the responsibility of the ministry themselves because they've got their own lives and business and everything to do too, you know. And then, last but not least, Jose, he was a pastor uh, at a health and wealth church. His job was just to make money. He wasn't even sure of his own salvation. His daughter came to our church a couple years ago after he was... Uh, cut off from that church and they came to know Christ for real and he's just a huge blessing just so full of grace so humble just loves the Lord he's got a lot of health issues he's a kidney recipient well he's been in the hospital three weeks now he got COVID got put in the hospital and two weeks ago got intubated and he's still hanging in there but uh He's still intubated, too. So just love for you guys to pray for, for Jose. His daughter, uh, Camila, is just an amazing blessing in our church. But while she was in this other church, married an unsaved guy, he's still not saved. He's heard the gospel dozens of times. We've had services in their home. She wrote last week and said, I never thought I'd ever say this, but my unsaved husband is on his knees praying for my dad. So Alex knows the truth. And we're praying that he'll finally surrender his life to Christ. So as you pray for Jose, remember to pray for Camila and Alex as well, because we'd love to see Alex saved. And I mean, I could just go on sharing story after story after story with you, but let me just end with a quick little thought. A lot of these are about people seeing Christ in other people, people seeing Christ in our church people, seeing Christ in Ronaldo, seeing Christ through us giving COVID relief when it's got nothing to do with us. By the way, I've been writing everything down, but I'd never tallied anything up. And just now in April, I tallied up, and we're still getting gifts for corona. We never asked for one. And it's not because of us at all. But over $30,000 has gone through our hands for COVID relief in a year. You can't explain that, except God. You can't. But that sometimes too familiar story of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fiery furnace and he sees four men walking around and he describes the fourth. What the Bible never says, and we need to be careful sometimes when we kind of gloss over something we've read many times, the Bible never says Shadrach, Meshach or Abednego saw the fourth man. I'm not saying they didn't. The Bible doesn't say they did. And what I want to use that for is to say, you and I, like they, had already affirmed with their words, knew who stood with them. They told Nebuchadnezzar that. They didn't need to see him or feel him to know he was with them. All they had to do was live their lives. Other people would see who was with them. And it's the exact same thing that God wants for you 
and for me. Though having not seen him, we believe. And that maybe after contact with us, we're so different from other people, they go, what just happened? Or they remind me of somebody that seems like I've known or heard about. I know, it's Jesus. And then God can make our paths meet so we can take it to the next level. So may you and I and Jan continue to live in a way where people see Jesus in us and we are bold enough to use his word through our mouths to let people know in this hopeless, lost world around us that there is hope indestructible in Jesus Christ.